to our musicians and thank you for coming today to our Sabbath school class. I want to welcome those who are studying with us here at the Granite Bay Church. Always want to welcome also the extended class. We know that we have um, a group of thousands around the world that study the lesson with us and we're thankful, we're honored that we're able to uh, have part of this um, broader class where we study God's Word together. Uh, as most of you know, here at Granite Bay, in the adult class anyway, we study the lesson three weeks ahead of the schedule of most of the world, and that just gives us time to edit the lessons. We put in subtitles, in some places they're translated, and then send them out to the various networks. It just takes a little time to do that. Uh, the day may come. We're working on the technology now where when we move into our new building, we will actually be able to teach the same lesson and broadcast it live on AFTV and the other stations, other networks will pick it up. So wouldn't that be nice if we could actually do it live at the same time? So we're working on that, the technology to do that. Uh, as mentioned, we're going into <coughs> lesson number 10. Was that me? Or is, no, I know it was me, but I don't know. Make sure everything's tight. Go ahead, turn it back on. Houston, we have a problem here. Oh, I, f I found it. Yeah, all's good. No, no, I got it. I got it. Yeah. Th there's two screws on this thing, and one of two of them can become loose. All right, we've got to start all over again. Morning, everybody. <laughs> I'll have to edit all that out. But, uh, yeah, I think we got that fixed. Our lesson for today is lesson number 10. It's the third missionary journey of Paul. We have a memory verse. And the memory verse is from Acts chapter 20, verse 24. And I always appreciate if you can say it with me. Uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 24, here in your lesson, it's from the New Revised Standard Version. You ready? I do not count my life of any value to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the good news of God's grace. You know, if we stop right here, if you were to memorize that verse and made it sort of a motto for your life, the lesson would not be in vain. For Paul to say, I don't count my life. The only thing that matters is that I might be faithful and that I could tell others the gospel. That's what he's saying here. Wouldn't that be a great place to come to in your Christian experience where you could have that that experience where you say, it's not I but Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. The only thing that matters is that I'm faithful to do whatever God wants me to do and reflecting the gospel. That's a great scripture reading for us to memorize. All right, now we're on Paul's third missionary journey. And maybe I'll begin, and I should tell you what our assignment is today. We're going to do our best to try to cover uh, Acts chapter 18, uh, verses 24 through Acts chapter 21, verse 15. You heard the story about the hunters that were out in the woods hunting. And uh, one had a rifle, one had a shotgun. And they came to the edge of the woods where it opened up into a great meadow. And they looked down into the meadow below and there were ten deer. And the hunter that had the shotgun said, Don't move. If I shoot now, I can hit them all. And his friend said, you probably will hit them all, but we won't take anything home. He said, if you could hold still, let me shoot. I'll hit one, and we'll take it home. Of course, you all understand the difference between a shotgun that sprays everywhere and a rifle that has one bullet. Well, you know what the challenge is for me as a Sabbath school teacher is people say, Karen talked to me about it this morning. They say, you're not covering the whole lesson. And I said, well, there's so much to cover that I just have to do a flyover, and it's like firing a little buckshot at everything, you know? You kind of hit a little bit of everything, but you don't take anything home. Or i got to slow down and try and cover something well. So which way do you want it, friends? You rifle or shotgun today? <laughs> you want a rifle. <laughs> that makes some of the teachers that are watching mad because they watch my lesson before they teach, and they say, you never even got to Wednesday and Thursday. Well, I'll do my best. Let's see what happens. I just wasted time, didn't I? Okay. Um, well, uh, it's so hard to decide. Let, let's go, and I just want to read a little introduction because we're talking about his third journey, but we sort of need to wrap up his second journey. Go to Acts chapter 18, and you can go to uh, verse 18. He's in Corinth. Now, we never did read this last week. So Paul, Acts 18, 18. So Paul remained a good while, and then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, 
And Priscilla and Aquila were with him. And he had his hair cut off in Centria, and he had taken a vow. This is the first of two times he does that. And he comes to Ephesus. Now he's in Ephesus. We're going to go back to Ephesus in a minute. And he left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay longer with them, he did not consent. He took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep the coming feast in Jerusalem. But I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. So on this third journey, he does go back to Ephesus straight away. And when he had landed in Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he had gone to Jerusalem, then he goes to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and he went over to the region of Galatia and Phrygia in order to strengthen all of the disciples. Now, it takes a little detour here, and it introduces uh, someone who is to become a champion in the gospel by the name of Apollos. Now, I'm in Acts chapter 18, 24. A certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, I want to give somebody a front warning. You're going to have a verse for me in a minute. Okay, 1 Corinthians, you have that? A certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, he came to Ephesus. Now Paul's in Ephesus. He's gone back there. He also sees Paul there. This man, having been instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in spirit, he spoke and he taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. Now this concept of only understanding the baptism of John comes up twice in the next few passages. You'll also see it in Acts chapter 19. Y let me just see if I can give you the, the picture. Who is the greatest of the prophets according to Jesus? John the Baptist. He was, his ministry was short, but it was powerful. The teachings of John, the call to repentance, and what was John's message? Repent for kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said, I baptize you with water. What's the rest of that? But there's another one coming whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. I am the voice of one preparing the way of the Lord. I am here to announce the coming of the Messiah. There's one who stands among you. Say, they thought the Messiah was going to be, you know, just some glorious king, but they remembered, you know, David was one of us and he became a great king. And then finally Jesus comes to the Jordan, he's baptized. John the Baptist says, Behold. Now he says that several times. So John introduced Jesus. John preached repentance. John said, Prepare the way of the Lord. John said, I baptize you with water, but there's a better baptism coming, a Holy Spirit fire baptism that will come through the Messiah. So a lot of people were converted. It says all of Judea and Jerusalem went out to the Jordan. They were baptized of John. There was a great awakening that happened through the ministry and the teaching of John. A great return to the Bible. And, um, and they'd heard that Jesus was introduced, but they hadn't really heard a lot about the teachings of the apostles and of Jesus. They didn't have email back then. They didn't have printing presses back then. The only way these things traveled was by foot. You know, some things went by letter, but these gospels had not been written yet. Okay, so Apollos believed in John. He even believed that Jesus was the Messiah that had been introduced, but he didn't understand a lot of the teachings about how do you prove that Jesus is the Messiah. And so, but he's an eloquent man, and it says he's taught in the way of the Lord. You might be interested to know the word there where it says he had been instructed in the way of the Lord. That comes from where you, you know what a catechism is? We think a catechism, we always think Catholic Church. It's not a bad word. It, it actually, in the Greek here, it's catechesis or something, but it's very similar. It means to be taught. Typically a catechism is teaching through questions and answers, which is not a bad way to teach, which is why the Catholics say if you give us your children, they'll be Catholics for life, because they teach them to question and answer and they indoctrinate them. Well, that principle, train up a child in the way he should go, is true, in many respects. And that's why we need to teach the children questions and answers, get them to think for themselves, get them rooted in the truth, not in the counterfeit. Amen? And so anyway, that's the word that was used. And so Apollos is mighty in the Scriptures, but he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, without embarrassing them, they took him aside. Now, if you've got to correct a person, do you do it publicly? They say, oh, you know, 
the, you're, you're mighty in the scriptures. You, you know, we can tell you love the Lord and God is using you, but can we share a little Bible study with you? There's something maybe you don't know yet we'd like to share with you. They take them aside. They start talking more about Jesus and the baptism of the Spirit and what the different parables and teachings of Christ. And he, he embraced it all. Because, you know, John had, adver had announced that Jesus was the Messiah. And so he became a mighty preacher there in Ephesus. And uh, they taught him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Acacia to the brethren, they wrote, exhorting the disciples that they should receive him. And he arrived and he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews, publicly showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. So how should we be presenting the truth? From the scriptures. Now did the Jews believe the scriptures? They did. So here we are Seventh-day Adventist Christians. The Lord's given us the three angels message. There are a lot of God's people in other churches. Amen? Some of them are mighty in the word, but they don't understand the whole three angels message. Maybe they don't know or understand the state of the dead, or they don't understand that the Sabbath is still intact. And in love we ought to go to them and study with them and teach them the word of God more perfectly, right? From what? The scriptures. So there's a great revival that followed because of what Apollos did. Now, Apollos, he ends up, as far as we can tell, he ends up being recognized in the same capacity as uh, an apostle. And uh, he really grew strong. At least he was an evangelist. You're going to read a verse just to give a little more insight on that. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 5 and 6. Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Now who's one of the greatest apostles in the New Testament? Well, Paul writes almost 50% of the New Testament. Paul is one of the greatest evangelists. I mean, we're talking now about the third missionary journey of Paul. There was actually four. There may have been others we don't know about. We don't know if he made it to Spain. History is unclear about that. Um, incredible evangelist from town to town raising up churches right and left. You know, our church struggles to raise up a church. I mean, our denomination at large, not so much overseas as in North America, it's getting more difficult. We praise God. This is a church plant. And uh, God willing, as we continue to grow, we can plant churches in Folsom and other places. Amen? But Paul was a mighty. So when they start comparing to the Corinthians, two of the greatest evangelists, just the fact that you would be listed with Paul really says a lot about Apollos. They saw the great work that had been done by Apollos in Corinth and other places. And he was, he was a, and you'll find his name mentioned many times through the writings of Paul. He ended up becoming just a real, I mean you got Billy Sunday, you got Dwight Moody, you got Billy Graham. You know there's just a few really great evangelists we think of in the English world. Um, Apollos ends up becoming one of them. So I just wanted you to understand the stature of this man and how powerful and eloquent he really was. Acts 19, trying to continue, not just do the whole shotgun thing. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth. Apollos is doing a great revival at Corinth. But Paul, having passed through the upper coast, he comes to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he says to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We've not heard whether there is any Holy Spirit. You know, the, the, every Jew uh, and, and even the Gentiles understood there was a Spirit. So they're speaking a little bit um, in exaggeration here, hyperbole you might say. They said, well no, there's been no teaching on this. What are you talking about? He says, into what then were you baptized? Remember there's both baptisms. Jesus said, unless you are born of the water, John's baptism, and the Spirit, Jesus' baptism, you cannot enter the kingdom. You need both baptisms, right? And they said, well, we've heard about the baptism of repentance of John, but what is this, the Holy Spirit being poured out? They didn't know much about Jesus. Paul said, indeed, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying that the people should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Jesus, who John announced. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now I want to pause right here. People often ask, Pastor Doug, is there ever a time for rebaptism? Is it ever appropriate to be rebaptized? I was baptized as a child, or when, you know, maybe they were baptized as a baby. You should be rebaptized because the Bible doesn't support infant baptism. 
because before you're baptized you need to believe with all your heart. Maybe you can't really do that. You need to be repenting. Maybe what's he going to repent of? And you need to um, be taught. It's hard to teach a baby. And so when you look at the criteria of what is needed for baptism, babies shouldn't be baptized. But when a child gets old enough to understand the claims of the gospel, to believe, to be taught, they have their own personal relationship with Jesus, this may happen at different times. People say, how old should a child be before they're baptized? I've seen children that maybe were nine years old that were ready because they just had a spiritual maturity about them and a personal relationship with Jesus. Uh, you go to Europe, I know if we have some more of our friends here from Eastern Europe, and they say, oh, 16, 21, we don't baptize until they get older. Is that right? Yeah, I see some nods there. Uh, and so it varies. Um, someone, James White, was once taking some children to the river to be baptized during a camp meeting, and they said, Elder White, don't you think those children are a little young for baptism? And he said, well, let me ask you a question. Do you think these children are old enough to be lost? They said, well, yes. He said, then they're old enough to be saved. <laughs> so uh, the idea is they need to be able to understand, you know, what's right and wrong. And that what that exact age of accountability is, you've got to be careful about fixing a point. You know, as a, as a sort of a, a rough meter, you might say, how old was Jesus when he was bar mitzvah and he went to the temple? He was 12. So that's sort of a ballpark. But some are ready earlier, some are ready later. If a person has some mental deficiency, they may never be ready. You know what I mean? And so um, it just, you understand. So there is a time for rebaptism. Three reasons you should be rebaptized. One is you were not baptized biblically, I baptized as a baby. Um, two, if you were baptized and you've backslidden in a big, big way, baptism is like marriage. Do you know if you're married to someone and you divorce them legally, you've got to get remarried. Now that doesn't mean if married people have an argument, they've got to get remarried. Some people say, Pastor Doug, I slipped and fell. I should be rebaptized. No, not necessarily, because some of you get baptized every week. <laughs> and so, you know, you say, well, what's the appropriate? How? You know, if a person turns their back on the Lord, they turn from the church, and they go out in the world, if they're returning, there might be a need for rebaptism. Um, and if a person comes to me and they're getting rebaptized for the fifth time, there's something wrong. They don't understand it. Uh, and then the third reason for rebaptism falls in the category of Acts 19, where these uh, Ephesian believers, there was just a whole truth. They were baptized by immersion, correct baptism. Um, but John the Baptist, right ministry, did it. Uh, but there's so much they didn't understand. And when they finally learned all this truth about Jesus that they had missed, they were baptized into the entire truth. I remember hearing about a um, Baptist minister went to an evangelistic meeting and, and after hearing the entire series, he accepted the Sabbath truth and he went to the pastor and said, you know, I think I should be rebaptized. The pastor said, now, you're a Baptist. He said, right. He said, you baptized by immersion. Right. He said, well, you technically were baptized correctly. Uh, you could join the church by profession of faith. He said, well, I was baptized into nine commandments. I want to get baptized into all ten. And so that would be this kind of case. Now there's something else that happened here when they're rebaptized. Read on. It says here that Paul rebaptized them. I'm in verse um, 5. In the name of the Lord. And he laid hands on them and the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they spoke with tongues and they prophesied. Now that does not mean they babbled. What does the word prophesy mean when Paul uses the word? It means to preach. Uh, it means teaching the word, preaching the word. Prophesying does not, sometimes we think of a prophet like Elijah or somebody foretelling the future. John the Baptist was a great prophet. Isn't that right? Tell me a, uh, you know, I guess the only prophecy John the Baptist made was about Jesus. There's one coming after me. But John didn't really foretell the future. Uh, he was a teacher of repentance. Uh, the Bible says Philip had four daughters that did prophesy. That doesn't mean they went around foretelling the future. It means the four daughters of this evangelist were also doing evangelism. They were teaching. And so um, when these men were speaking in tongues, what were they saying? They were prophesying. They were teaching in other languages. Whenever you have the speaking of tongues in the Bible, there's three examples. I told you this before, but some I'm sure we're not here. Acts 2. What's the other one? 
Acts 10 and Acts 19. You're, these, this is the last example of speaking in tongues in the Bible. I'm not talking about where Paul talks about speaking in tongues in 1 Corinthians 14. The example of speaking in tongues is three examples. All three examples, there are multiple language groups present. Purpose for tongues is that you might communicate the gospel in the languages of people present that they may not understand. These are Ephesian believers, Paul and others with him spoke different languages. They heard what they were saying. What were they saying? They were prophesying. They were teaching in these other tongues. And around Ephesus there were many languages that were spoken in the Roman Empire. There were local tribal languages. There was Latin. There was Greek. And Paul spoke Hebrew. So, is that clear? Okay. Anyway, so, and it's also interesting, it tells us there were 12 of them in all. Now, do you think he mentions that by accident? Or is this just sort of one of the Bible ways of saying the gospel now is going from 12 Jewish apostles, the Holy Spirit is now being poured on 12 Gentile apostles. See what's happening? They are being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Just like at Pentecost, you got the 12 in the upper room. Uh, that are preaching, well, 120 in the upper room, but you have 12 apostles, and there's another 12. And it's, God is kind of saying the church now is exploding among the Gentiles. It's not just for the Jews. All right. Now, another interesting story. I just don't want to rush past this. Acts 19, verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, um, any exorcists present? There's a movie a few years ago that uh, became very popular called The Exorcist about, you know, Catholic priests that specialize in casting out devils. And for a while there, there were some Protestant churches that became involved and we got those who specialize in casting out demons. Uh, I always find that's a, a, a dubious practice that uh, anyone who is a minister that says it's, that's my special gift is I cast out devils. I don't think you ever go, ought to go looking for it. Jesus did say to the disciples, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you'll, you will be able to cast out devils. But I don't think you ever hang out your shingle and say, you know, demons are us, we cast out devils or anything like that. So here these young men are going out, they're Jewish exorcists, took it upon themselves to call on the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. And they would say, we exorcise you by Jesus, who Paul preaches. That's sort of like, you know, a secondhand exorcism, I suppose. And there were seven sons of Sceva, a, Jew, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. Another interesting number. How many sons? Just went from 12 to 7. These things have spiritual significance. Uh, and these are from the Jewish priest. And the evil spirits answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overpowered them and prevailed against them, so they fled out of the house naked and wounded. That's very interesting. You've got these seven sons of a Jewish priest who are trying to cast out devils, and it's like they're using the old method. And the devils say, you know, you can't just ca call out Jesus' name like you're saying open sesame or abracadabra. It's some sp magic word. You ever heard people do that? They, they, just, they think if they just call out the name of Jesus without knowing Christ or what it means to pray in His name, in His character, or having a relationship with Him, that there's some magic in the Word. The Bible doesn't teach that. There's authority in the name of God. It's especially in the character of God. And so um, they're just calling out this name. They have no relationship. They've not surrendered to Jesus. And the demons say, oh yeah, we know Paul. And we know Jesus. But who are you? And uh, the devil, this one demon-possessed man, overpowers seven young men, beats them up, wounds them, strips them, and they flee naked. Now this is, again, filled with spiritual significance because what happened to Adam and Eve after they wrestled with the devil? Did they end up wounded and naked? Spiritually wounded and naked? What did the devil do to that man in Acts chapter 5 that was filled with a legion of demons? Was he wounding himself and naked? And you can find just through the Bible when that man fell among thieves and the devil was the thief in that story, the Good Samaritan story, they stripped him. The devil strips us of all righteousness and he wounds us with sin. 
And it's through Christ coming along, He heals us and He binds up our wounds. And so it also I think is significant. It says these are seven sons of a priest. It's like they're trying to put the new wine and old wineskins of Judaism. And there was no power there. They had a form of religion without power. There are a lot of churches out there that are taking the name of Jesus and they don't know Jesus. Hey, you've read that prophecy in Isaiah chapter 4 where it says, In that day seven women will take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and we will wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. Kind of like a picture of a lot of churches in the last name. They want to use the name of Jesus but they don't want the righteousness of Christ. They don't want the teachings of Christ. They got their own bread, their own Bible. They got their own apparel, their own righteousness, but they want His name. That describes a lot of churches in the last days. All right, so they're not able to cast out the devil. One more thing. Oh, there's so much here. I just, you know, I just want you to share my frustration. Um, it's just hard to rush through this stuff. It's so rich. The devil said, Paul I know. But he said to these seven young men, Who are you? Are there some workers for God that the devil knows? Why does the devil know? Why did the devil know who Paul was? Paul was just invading his territory. Now, the devil, is he all knowing? Now, God knows everybody, doesn't he? But the devil and his demons, they don't know everybody. They're not om omniscient, they don't know everything. But there's some that the devil knows. The devil knows the ones that are taking his people. And Paul was a real threat to the devil. And uh, now how many of you would like to pray that the devil knows who you are? You don't want to raise your hand, do you? <laughs> you kind of do. You say, yeah, I want to cause the devil trouble, but I, I don't want his special attention. But I do want the Lord to be placed, but, but I don't want the devil to know. <laughs> You're going, how do I do this? All right, moving on. Go to Acts 19.21. And someone's going to read for me a minute in uh, Romans 5. And it says, um, these things were accomplished. Um, oh, actually, let me see. I want to read. Um, yeah. Okay. Acts 19.21. So it says, these things were accomplished that Paul purposed in his spirit, he had passed through Macedonia and Acacia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I've been there I must also see Rome. And so it doesn't say exactly why he's going to Rome here in Acts 19, but we find out in Romans and in 1 Corinthians 16 why he's going to Rome. If you look in 1 Corinthians 16 verse 1, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given order to the churches of Galatia, so you must also do on the first of the week, let each one of you lay by him something to in storing up as God may prosper him, that there be no collections when I come. This is not a church offering. He says that you don't have an offering when I come. And I'll come to you, whatever you give, you might approve by your letters, I will send and bear your gifts to Jerusalem. They were bringing a special gift from Ephesus down to Jerusalem, if it is fitting. Go ahead and read your verse for us. Romans 15, 25 to 26. But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints, for it be pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. Yeah, so it's pretty clear they're bringing a gift down. Now, during this third journey, and I think we got a map up on the screen. I'm going to pop up the real quick. And I know some of the towns are going to be small on your map, so I'll just give it to you here. This journey sort of begins in Antioch, and he makes his way through Tarsus, which is where Paul used to live, Derby, Lystra, Iconium, Pisidia. He stops in Laodicea and then he goes directly to Ephesus. He promised them he'd come back. He spends time there with them in, Eph in Ephesus. Makes his way up through Smyrna, Pergamos, goes to Troas, crosses over into Macedonia, and that's where he spends time in Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, circles down, goes to visit Corinth again, goes around Athens, has an adventure there and uh, ends up making his way back. He's bringing a gift to the believers back in Jerusalem. Goes back down through um, um, Mytilene, uh, Miletus, Kos, uh, Patra, and stops in Tyre. Makes his way back up to Jerusalem. 
So this is a big circuitous trip he takes going through Macedonia, spends significant time in Ephesus uh, on that trip. Anyway, but um, <coughs> they have some problems in Ephesus. You go to verse 21 of Acts 19. <coughs> when these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the spirit that when he had passed through Macedonia and Acacia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I've been there, I must see Rome. We just read that. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus. But he himself stayed in Asia for a time. So he's by himself. And about that time there arose a great commotion about the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Diana, he brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of a similar occupation and said, Men, they had a union meeting is what it was, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all of Asia, this Paul, not only did the devil know who he was, but all the silversmith that were making and selling idols throughout Asia knew who he was. Throughout almost all of Asia, Paul has persuaded and turned many away, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. Now was that a special Christian teaching or is that also a Jewish teaching? That's the Ten Commandments. Don't make idols. Paul was just doing what the Jews should have been doing all those years that they were in Asia. Paul that's not very popular, is it? To go through a culture and tell them, you know, those silver gods that you guys make? They're not gods. I mean, wouldn't the polite, politically, politically correct thing be to do? You know, we don't want to upset them. But Paul was a bold preacher and he was more concerned about offending God than offending man. And so he was telling them those are worthless idols. He was saying what Isaiah said. And so much so that the market began to fall out in the idol business. And Demetrius said, look, we've got to have a meeting. We've got to have a rally and turn this thing around. This guy is wrecking our business. Not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, as it should, and also the temple of the great goddess Diana, Artemis, may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all of Asia and the world worship. That's another example of hyperbole in the Bible. Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out. And they all have this big get together and they gather in the theater and they say, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. They have a pep rally. So the whole city was filled with confusion and they rushed into, to, and they seized the altar with one accord, having seized Gaius and Ar Aristarchus, the Macedonians, Paul's traveling companions. And when Paul wanted to go in to the people, the disciples would not allow him. Then some Paul, whenever he saw a crowd, said, Let me at him. Let me at him. Uh, that's an evangelist for you. You know, when they're torturing you, he wants to convert the torturers. An evangelist gets hit by a car in the ambulance. He wants to convert the paramedics. Paul was being torn limb from limb in the temple, and the Romans rescued him. And Paul says to the Romans, Can I preach to them? I got a crowd. And I kind of know the feeling. Whenever I see a crowd, I think, Oh man, where's the microphone? <laughs> you know, you just, you want to preach. And so he wants to go and they say, Paul, they will kill you in there. They're, they're all mad this whole rally is because you are wrecking their business and you want to go preach to them. He says, yeah, but I want to tell them why idols are so bad. These are the idol makers. Are you sure you want to go in there? And, and they, they probably were wise in telling Paul not to do that. And they had this big commotion. I don't have time to read it all. For two hours they're shouting, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And finally you get uh, one of the officials in the community says, well, he comes everyone down, he says, what's going on here? Says, what kind of uproar is this? This is a, a Romanly governed community. We have laws. If the silversmith have something against others, the courts are open. File a claim. They can do it in an orderly manner. He says, there's no excuse for this raucous concourse, this riot. And he, he speaks very reasonably. You know, the Romans had some good laws. Matter of fact, even some of the American laws are based on Greco-Roman laws. We got a Senate, we got a Congress, right? And so um, <coughs> he settles them all down. They had a representative government, they had courts, and, and he dismisses the assembly. And, and, uh, but it, it turned into a riot because of Paul's preaching. All right, journeys in Greece. We're going to move on, chapter 20. And uh, if you look in... Uh, we're talking about Troas now. 
Acts 20, verse 7. Let's jump here to Eutychus. This is a great story. And now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread. Now what does that mean? First day of the week, that's Sunday, huh? Disciples come together to have a communion service. Ah, there you got it. Saturday has been changed to Sunday. This is the verse I often hear when people say, we can prove that the apostles were keeping Sunday as a day of worship. Because here you have it. The disciples came together on the first day of the week to break bread. Keep reading. I've heard pastors just read that one spot and they stop. Paul, ready to depart the next day, it says he continued his message until midnight. Now, first of all, let me ask you this. During this meeting, is it day or night? Night. When does a day begin biblically? When the sun goes down. So when it says they got together on the first day of the week, they have an evening meeting. They've been together all day Sabbath. They gather that Sunday evening because why Paul is going to leave the next day. It's his last chance to build them up before he leaves. They're also going to break bread. But isn't that a communion service? No. Go ahead, read for us, Dan. Acts 2, verse 46. I know I didn't give the cameras a chance to <laughs> track in on you, but... Acts 2, 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness in simplicity of heart. Breaking bread, they ate their food. Not all breaking bread is a religious ceremony. The Bible uses the word breaking bread talking about eating. Jesus broke bread with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, that story. They were just eating together. Not every time they ate was it a religious ceremony. It just means they were going to break bread. Keep reading here. Go back to the, the Eutychus story. It says, There are many lamps with them in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And on a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep. And he was overcome by sleep as Paul continued speaking. Now that could be either a sermon about not sleeping during church, you could fall out the window, or it could be a lesson to ministers not to preach too long, or people will fall asleep and fall out the window. Uh, either way, there's a lesson there. And Paul went down, he fell out the window, he's taken up dead, he dies. And Paul went down and fell on him and embraced him and said, do not trouble yourselves for his life is in him. Paul embraced him just like when Elijah and Elisha embraced two different times. They each embraced a boy. They touched the boy that had died and they were resurrected. And Paul does. He's got the same power of Elijah and Elisha. And um, this greatly encouraged the church there that was in Troas. But Paul went down, he fell on him, and they came up and they broke bread. Here they're breaking bread again. They'd eaten and he talked a long while, even till daybreak, and he departed. And they brought the young man alive, and they were not a little comforted. It mentions the young man at the end of the story. Why is this story in the Bible? Is this story there to tell us this is the story where they inaugurate a new day as the Sabbath? It's not at all what it's saying. That's a dishonest interpretation of the verse. It's saying they had been together all day Sabbath. After the first day of the week began, in the evening, Paul is making his final presentation to him. It's what we would call Saturday night. They're just, they're coming together to have an evening meal of vespers. Doesn't say it's a religious service. And you know what? It doesn't matter even if it was a religious service. What day of the week was the first communion? Was it Sabbath? Was it Friday? Thursday. So is there anything in the Bible that says that if you break bread it has to be on the Sabbath? No. It could be any day of the week. So to use this verse to say this is the inauguration of a new Sabbath uh, is I think a very weak and it's frankly a very dishonest text to use. This story is in the Bible to tell us Eutychus died, Paul resurrected him, it ends by saying they were not a little comfort, comforted that the young boy survived. Amen? This, I mean what a, I mean you think about God speaking the Sabbath from the mountain. Remember the Sabbath day and they say yeah this is the place where you find him changing it. Well that would be a very mild way to change one of the commandments of God sort of a fleeting reference like this. So that's not what this is talking about. All right, I got time for maybe a little bit more. Miletus, Acts 20, verse 15. Then we sailed from there, and the next day we came opposite, uh, opposite Choas. The following day we arrived at Samos and stayed at Trigilium. And the next day we came to, to Miletus, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. He's hastening back to Jerusalem. 
He wants to be there not only because he's bringing relief to the saints. There was a famine also in Jerusalem. There was great poverty. The saints were struggling. He's bringing an offering with him. And he also wants to be there for obviously Pentecost. When was the Holy Spirit poured out? Pentecost. What happened at Pentecost? Devout Jews out of every nation under heaven were there. What a great opportunity to preach to the devout Jews that had come to Jerusalem for all over the Roman Empire, indeed from Africa and Ethiopia. They'd come up and he said, oh man, it'd be a great time to be there and have an evangelistic meeting. So he's trying to get there to witness and to celebrate the Passover as well as to bring relief. And um, you know one of the most beautiful passages then, and you need to read this, Acts chapter 20, verse 17 through 37. I'll just read this to you and I'll close with it. He makes his last appeal. From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and he called for the elders of the church. And when they came to him he said, You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility and many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. How I kept back nothing that was helpful but proclaimed it to you. And I taught you publicly from house to house. And uh, I want to go to verse um, 6 here. I said Acts 21 verse 6. I'm sorry, 20 verse 6. Oh, well, am I getting my verse wrong here? No, it's Acts 20 verse oh, 20 here. That's what I want. Sorry, got little, the numbers are really small. <laughs> Serving the Lord with all humility and many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful but proclaimed it to you and taught publicly and from house to house, testifying to the Jews and the Greeks repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. See now I go bound in spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city saying that chains and tribulations await me. Paul said, I'm going to Jerusalem even though I know what's going to happen to me. Did Jesus say the same thing? Did the disciples try to talk Paul out of going to Jerusalem? But he said, there's nothing that can turn me away. Did Peter try to talk Jesus out of going to Jerusalem? And Jesus said, get behind me Satan, this is part of God's plan. See, Paul knew God wanted him to go it was through his arrest and his tribulations in Jerusalem he ended up going to Rome. A number of miracles happened along the way. There were many converts. The whole island of Malta was converted through Paul. He went to Rome. He ultimately preached to Caesar's household. He knew that God wanted this to happen. He did more in prison through his trials. Most of the letters you and I read, Paul wrote in jail. And so God had worked that all out. Anyway, there's a lot more I could say about that. But I got through 80% of the lesson. So with that I want to remind you we do have a special gift and it's called Three Steps to Heaven, offer number 102. If you'd like a free copy of that just dial 866-788-3966. If you've not invited Jesus into your heart, if you've not accepted Christ, you can do that right now. But then order this book and it'll take you through those steps. You'll be glad you did. If nothing else, read it and then share it with someone. It's a great witnessing resource. God bless you until we study His Word together again next week.